I'm thrilled to be able to be here with you all. We are going to dive into Gavin Ortland's comments in regards to the canon. We will look at the information Gavin Ortland puts out. And God willing, we will provide a cogent, a logical defense of the Deuterocanonical texts as Holy Writ, as Sacred Scripture. We'll deal with each of his arguments that he puts out in regards to the canon. Uh, actually, every single one, and as you know very well, every time I do a response to Dr. Ortland, I, I am very detailed. I leave nothing. Um, I, I, I cover everything. No stone unturned. Um, and that will be the case today as well. I have no idea this will go half an hour or an hour. I have not watched the full video. Uh, rather, I saw a screenshot that, uh, that Gavin Ortland had posted. Uh, it'll be this one right here. So I was shown this screenshot here where somebody wants Gavin to share where in the early church he have any Protestant, any Protestant views that can be found. And uh, he will give Jerome, who, as we know, Jerome does not support Gavin's position on anything uh, that is particularly uh, exclusively Protestant. Uh, but he lists, lists Jerome, Athanasius, Cyril of Jerusalem, I presume, uh, Pope Gregory the Great, and uh, uh, John Dam John Damascene, I presume, on the canon. None of them are allies of his in the canon. None of them are allies. Not a single one of them. And then he, uh, of course, lists Augustine, John Chrysostomus, and Justification. Interestingly enough, both of them believed in purgatory, and both believed that good works were necessary for salvation and did not believe in sola fide. So that's very interesting, but we're not surprised because modern-day Protestantism realizes they have their backs up against the wall, and they are trying to work uh, from the deficit that they are in. They're trying to reinterpret early church fathers, and they have even reinterpreted a lot of the rallying cries of the Reformation. You find Scripture alone being reinterpreted, sola fide as well, even the canon, because they realize that they stick to what the original Reformers believed, they are toast. They have no position in the early church. They have no ancient pedigree, no foothold in the ancient Christianity. So in order to fit in, they will reinterpret a lot of these beliefs, and they will try to do so to make it seem as if, well, look, uh, early Christianity was a mishmash of all kinds of beliefs. Uh, and really, it just really doesn't work uh, because, you know, the more and more they attempt to do that, the more and more we expose their egregious errors. And we're going to find that um, even though I have not seen the full video yet, so I will be reacting in real time. Um, even though I haven't seen the full video, I've seen maybe a 30 second clip. You're going to find the same old uh, issues with Gavin's material are going to um, are going to prop up where I just don't think Gavin is uh, presenting the best or accurate information, if you will. Uh, so hopefully we can delve into that. Hopefully we can dive in. Hopefully we can provide a logical and cogent response to his material. Let's dive in now. First, let me uh, interact with Trent on the Deuterocanonical books. Uh, Trent argues that the early Eastern Church didn't consider the Deuterocanonical books to be uninspired. Let's look at these sources. I think Trent does a, a fine job here, and I don't think Gavin's response to Trent um, is good at all. In fact, this is the only clip that I have seen. Closer. You'll see that in many cases they come from canonical lists where the church fathers recognize the Deutero canon is controversial because the Jews rejected it, but they don't consider the Deutero canon to be uninspired in the same way that modern Protestants do. For example, John of Damascus or John Damascene from the 7th century believed in an older theory that there could only be 22 books of the Old Testament to correspond to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. But he still uses the Deuterocanon like scripture. He quotes 2 Maccabees to show God is omniscient. He calls Wisdom 3.1 divine scripture. He also gives examples from Athanasius. Trent is right in the point that he's making here, but it's not a rebuttal of anything I said. I had actually mentioned this two-tier system that many early Christians... Let me break it down immediately. Uh, if you want to talk about a multi-tiered system, that is fine. But I think the most important thing, the thing that we bring out in our videos, the things we brought out in our debates here, the things that the Master Gary has brought out, is not parking the bus on the word canon, whether it be in the Greek or whether it be in the Latin, not parking the word there, not parking the bus there, but rather 
How did the early fathers view sacred scripture? Were the deuterocanonical books utilized as sacred scripture? Not how the word canon was used, because you even have top liberal scholars and conservative scholars that will tell you the way canon means used in St. Athanasius and various other fathers varies. Canon is used in a different way. It doesn't always mean what is only relegated to Holy Writ. That's really important because you'll have Athanasius and you'll have others that will provide lists for you. And then a Protestant will say, well, look, their canon resembles ours. The problem is modern day Protestants use the term canon and Catholics too, to refer to the list of the books that are part of the Bible. Now, when we use it in that way, you find that a number of fathers didn't use it that way. How did they use the term? They used it differently. They would refer to canonical texts utilized for a certain purpose, and then ecclesiastical ones, which were godly, which were the word of God as Athanasius claims and very clearly proves because that's from apostolic tradition. Now, here's the important thing. It is how the word canon is used. I can't emphasize that enough. It isn't how that is used. Rather, it's how did the early church fathers and early councils utilize the deuterocanonical books and they use them as sacred scripture because we find various different ways of various different lists and uh, different ways in which the fathers communicated these lists. The most important thing is how did they view the deuterocanonical books? Did they view them as apocryphal? No, they didn't. They viewed them as sacred scripture. So let's stick to maybe not the word canon, because as we know, we'll see in a moment, it, it is used in a very different way in St. Athanasius. And for that, stay tuned for a mega roundtable that we have coming up very soon. And for a mega roundtable with a top Coptic scholar. We're going to, we're going to look, at, look at that material there. But very clearly, Athanasius was not using canon the way we use it today, because outside of his canon, he utilizes deuterocanonical, but by the way, his canon doesn't match up with Protestantism either. None of these guys that Gavin uh, believes are, are proto-Protestants in terms of the canon. None of them has a, have a canon that matches up with his. None of them. Uh, and very clearly, uh, uh, St. Athanasius is not on, on Gavin's side. But let's dig in uh, a little further. Held to where you've got the deuterocanonical books in a kind of second tier status. Sometimes the way of thinking is that the first tier canon is for dogma, sometimes, and the second tier canon is for edification. It really doesn't make any sense because you have uh, uh, a number of early fathers, including the great Saint Athanasius, that utilize the deuterocanon to defend the doctrine of the Trinity, to defend the deity of Christ. So uh, we got to be a little bit serious here. Uh, now, I don't know, let me, let me hear the rest of this. I don't know if Gavin is making that claim or saying that that claim has any weight, but the idea that the Deuterocanon has a lower status than the other books is, is incorrect. And so forth. Um, but there's different ways to understand that. But Trent is right. Uh, you know, he used the phrase non-canonical scripture. That's a fascinating, interesting way to put it. So he's... Yeah, because non-canonical scripture is very clearly the way certain fathers refer to them. Now... If we, it isn't fascinating, maybe it's a conundrum for Dr. Ortland, but it really is something you find in a lot of fathers where their lists or their utilization of canon is very different from the modern way that we use it. So non-canonical scripture is correct. The idea is how did they use the books of the Bible as scripture and the books of the Bible that are utilized, the Old Testament in particular, are the deuterocanonical books present as sacred scripture? And the answer is absolutely yes, they are. Right, that for a lot of these early Eastern fathers, the deuterocanonical books are inspired in some sense, but they're not at the same level as the first tier can. Yeah, well, here's the problem. None of these early fathers that utilized the deuterocanonical books and called them fountains of godliness or called them uh, um, scripture, sacred scripture, none of them say, well, you know what? Uh, they're not at the same level uh, uh, of inspiration as, uh, as the others. No, I challenge Dr. Ortland on that. And I challenge him to look at the way the early fathers use these canonical lists. But that doesn't go against anything I said. Uh, you know, it goes completely against everything you said. 
But one of my concerns in these rebuttal videos is distortion, where the original point is lost. So that it comes across to people who just watch that video like it's a rebuttal, but it's actually just making a separate point. I was responding to George Farmer's comments, which give the impression that there were 12 centuries of one view of the canon that the church decided, and then the Protestants came along and took books out of the Bible. And I was trying to show that's way off. Uh, there's a lot of diversity about the canon in the early and medieval church, as I pointed out, all the way up to the very decades prior to the Council of Trent, including among heavy hitting. Great, uh, great points. I have to give Gavin credit. You see, um, for people that say, you know, William, you're a real meanie. This is why Gavin won't debate your dialogue with you. You're, you're really mean to him. You know, you really hurt his feelings all the time. Um, that never, that is never my aim, never my goal. I never want to hurt Dr. Orland's feelings. I don't want to, I do not want to hurt his feelings. Uh, very clearly, when he does make a valid point, I will give credit for that valid point. And I think he has made a valid point here. Uh, because you do have different lists, even in the major codices that we have. Uh, but the important thing to point out is that even though you have different lists, at every council gathering, without exception, every time the church gathered in council and listed the books of the Bible, every time the deuterocanonical books were present, now, do we have different lists when we get to Athanasius, Cyril of Jerusalem? Without a doubt. But every time in all of these fathers, you have the Deuterocanonical books being used as holy writ, being used as sacred scripture. This does not fit into the Protestant mindset. It does not work. Because Gavin Ortland does not use the Book of Wisdom or the Book of Sirach or Judith or any of the other Deuterocanonical books as holy writ. Can you imagine Galvin Ortland at the pulpit preaching from the Book of Wisdom during the time of the, of the bodily resurrection of our Lord? Maybe to use it as a book that was valuable or historical, but the early church fathers didn't use the Book of Wisdom in that way. They used it to prove doctrine. The deuterocanonical books were used aplenty, heavily, during the Arian crisis and during other issues as well that the church dealt with. The deuterocanonical books were used to prove doctrine, not, well, you know, we're going to quote them, but you know what, it's, you know, these are, they're valuable, but, you know, they're not as important as, as the others. You really think that would have, you know, flown with the Arians? I mean, they would have had a field day with St. Athanasius, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, St. Basil the Great, St. Hilary of Poitiers. They would have had a field day with them. If these guys would have been quoting from books that, and books to prove doctrine, even Ambrose, by the way, St. Ambrose utilized the Deuter Canon as well, um, to prove Christological truths, they, they would have been laughed at. Well, you know what? You, you're, you're trying to rebut us from, you know, books that, uh, you know, we recognize that the church recognizes having a lower status. Really? They're going to quote them as the word of God, as scripture says? as sacred scripture, and they're not going to hold them in the same status as other sacred scripture. So how is, how is it that they can quote from Genesis, Exodus, the Gospels, and all these, and the Deuterocanon, and call them sacred scripture? Is there a level of how sacred the scripture is? You know, Gospel of Matthew is 99.9% .9 sacred, 99.9% percent, .9 percent sacred, and Book of Two Maccabees is 10% sacred. You know, what do we, how are we, how are we going to do that? Hey, you know, is there a kind of percentage that we're working on, that we're working with? Is the gospel of, uh, of Mark 99.9% .9 or 100% sacred? And, you know, you know, one Maccabees, 15 or 20% sacred? No. If they quoted them to prove doctrine, or they call them scripture, sacred scripture, or utilize them interspersed with sacred scripture, they're utilizing them as the word of God. Plain and simple. Now, we heard a little bit about John Damascene. And, you know, I saw that uh, screenshot. I was shocked at the claim that John Damascene would have been a proto-Protestant when it comes to the canon. Now, as Trent so aptly pointed out, John Damascene was dealing with an old, an old symbolic kind of idea. 
that there had to be 20 books of the Old Testament to correspond with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. We know that. We've heard many fathers uh, utilize similar. And then they don't have a list that even matches any Old Testament canon. Definitely not that of Protestantism. But as we pointed out, as we pointed out more, more than once, John of Damascus, John Damascus, utilized the Deuterocanon as Holy Writ all throughout his writings. A lot of times. Now, we've heard of a few times. Uh, uh, if you look online, um, you'll find that, uh, and I'm trying to look at my notes, uh, that there are a few references listed, but there are a lot. When I looked into him, when I went to the database to look at the amount of times he utilized the Deuter Canon, it's, it's a lot. And, and, you know, we're not arguing. We agree that the list of books that he gives doesn't include the Deuter Canonical books. Um, and he only mentions uh, wisdom and Ecclesiasticus. Um, but it, it's true that even the, even the New Testament is a wonky list. It's a weird list as well. You know, so his list doesn't match up with Protestantism. Uh, and the important thing is, uh, is that uh, the books, they're not meant to limit us on what John Damascene viewed was as sacred scripture. So the list very clearly, and I'm trying to look at my notes, it's very, very interesting how we only get a few listed in the Shaft edition, which is why I really encourage people, go out and get the scholarly volumes. The Shaft edition is really quickly becoming outdated. Although I do recommend everybody own it. Um, either which way, John of Damascus didn't have a list uh, that matched anyone's. But the, the important thing is, is not to look at the lists, but how he utilized books that in his dialogues, Old Testament or New Testament, did he quote them as sacred scripture? And do we find the Deuterocanon anywhere there? And we do. We do find it. And although the Holy Scripture says, therefore God, thy God, has anointed thee with gladness, it is to be observed that the Holy Scripture often uses the past tense instead of the future. As for example here, thereafter he was seen upon the earth and dwelt among men. For as yet God was not seen, nor did he dwell among men when this was said. And here again, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, wept, for as yet these things had not come to pass, that sin is on the Orthodox faith. We can see Baruch 3.38 quoted right along with the sacred scriptural text of Psalm 14 and 137. We're told that it is sacred scripture, holy scripture. We find that throughout all of the fathers over and over when they're obviously um, bringing up teachings that confirm doctrine, and they are calling the text Holy Scripture, that is incredibly important. Because one thing that I attempted to do was I recognized that one objection Protestants bring up often is, well, you know what, quotation doesn't equal canonical. And we agree. Here at the Apocrypha Apocalypse, we don't think that quotation means or equals canonical in the way that we're using canon today. We need to look at how these books were utilized in the early church. Were they being utilized as sacred scripture? Yes, they were. Did every council gathering, I don't care about Spurious Laodicea, did every council gather in Rome, Hippo, Carthage, the multiple Carthaginian ones, the North African code, did they include the Deuterocanon every time they laid out what was the Old Testament? Every time. Every time they did. Very important to point out. Today, the spiritual living ladder by which the Most High has appeared on earth to walk among human beings, quoting from Baruch 3, has herself climbed the ladder of death and gone up from earth to heaven. Wow! To celebrate the dormition of our Immaculate Mother Mary, celebrate the bodily assumption of Saint Mary, he utilizes one of the most important Christological texts that was used by the early church, the book of Baruch, a deuterocanonical book. He utilizes it to show us this is an example of the Most High appearing on earth, walking amongst human beings. Now, Holy Mary has climbed that ladder of death and gone up from earth to heaven. 
we've always pointed how pointed to how a proper Mariology points to a proper Christology and vice versa. And it's very clearly present in the great St. John of Damascus as well, who very clearly believed in the immaculate conception of St. Mary. Bodily assumption, Mary as our holy, sinless Theotokos, and as our wonderful and beautiful Ai Parthenos, our ever-virgin mother of God, our God-bearer. What a wonderful way that he lays this incredible teaching down. So John of Damascus, there are plenty more areas where I can go through. And indeed, there'll be a separate video here. As I realized here at the Apocrypha Apocalypse, we don't have a video on St. John Damascene alone. And yet we have many other fathers. and We're going to tap into St. John Damascene. So uh, if you are a patron, you have access already to these materials before they premiere for the general audience. So we thank you from the bottom of our hearts because we wouldn't be able to do this without our patrons helping us out. We would not be able to do it without your incredible help. And we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you very much for your help and your support. And as, uh, as Trent alluded to, uh, or I directly pointed to, the fact that uh, John Damascene quotes from Wisdom 3.1. He says, the divine scripture likewise saith that the souls of the just are in God's hand and death cannot lay hold of them. John Damascene quotes over and over from the Deuterocanon. You can find multiple examples of this. Multiple examples. There are more. He quotes from Tobit, Ecclesiasticus. There are many more. But of course, we're not doing an exhaustive show just on John Damascene. We're going through Dr. Ortland's arguments, and uh, we don't believe that Dr. Ortland is understanding the full force of the Catholic argument at all. Like cardinals and scholars, not just one or two of them. So, and then at the Council of Trent, it's very controversial uh, whether to remove. He's likely talking about uh, Cardinal Cajetan. And um, we've done a video just in Cardinal Cajetan. And uh, he is correct in, in the fact that Cardinal Cajetan, not only did he have a very, a very poor understanding of scripture of the Old Testament, he had a poor understanding of the New Testament as well. So we don't applaud Cardinal Cajetan for the way he listed sacred scripture at all. Very problematic. Um, uh, but let me hear what he says about Trent. That distinction between first and second tier canon, which they do with anathema. Okay. So Trent's... Uh, I'm not sure if he's talking about the fact that, uh, and this is why we pointed out over and over here at the Apocrypha Apocalypse, that the idea that the canon is open, books can be added later, is downright absurd. And we pointed it out over and over. Uh, we've done shows over and over. We've talked to canonical scholars. And the idea that the canon is open and that maybe later on when we uh, reunite with our, God willing, if we would ever reunite with our Eastern brothers and sisters, that perhaps we would uh, be able to view their books as uh, sacred scripture and the canon would be open is downright absurd. Now, is it possible that those books can be viewed as beneficial and ecclesiastical? Without a doubt. No doubt. Even today as a Catholic, you can view those books as, as beneficial, ecclesiastical, helpful. But, um, uh, you know, Trent was very clear when certain books were deemed apocryphal. And we've done a whole show just on this. And we've done, we've looked at the Latin of the text. We've read the scholars. I mean, nobody's done more work in this field than, than Gary and uh, and uh, Dr. Zabaris, our dear brother, our other, the other uh, part of the Apocrypha Apocalypse. I always butcher his last name. Love you, brother. Please forgive me there. What the Cyril's rationale for this prohibition was. Cyril writes, of these, that is of the divine scriptures, read the two and twenty books that have nothing to do with the apocryphal writings. Study earnestly these only, which we read openly in the church, far wiser and more pious than yourself were the apostles and the bishops of old time, the presidents of the church who handed down these books. Being therefore a child of the church, trench not upon its statutes. 
and of the Old Testament, as we have said, study the two and twenty books, which, if you are desirous of learning, strive to remember by name as I recite them. And then he goes through and lists the canon that I had mentioned in my last video. Uh, the canon list is uh, very similar to a Protestant canon. You just have a few differences, like Baruch enfolded into the book of Jeremiah, stuff like that. Outside of that, he does seem to use the word apocrypha for that which is outside of those books. Again, a very important point that we have to bring up every time is that, number one, again, the Cyril's list does not match up with Protestantism's list. It doesn't match up with the canon uh, that Gavin views to be inspired. Uh, the other issue is, again, is we recognize, but by the way, there is a three-tiered system that you find in Cyril. You have what he calls the scripture, then you have what is in Deutero, but how does he utilize in Deutero those books that are ecclesiastical? Does he use them in the lower status as not being valuable, as not being the word of God? We're going to look in a moment and we're going to realize that, of course not. And here's the important point. He doesn't list them as apocryphal, which are not to be read at all. Rather, he does use the Deuterocanonical books as sacred scripture. This is a very important point. We're going to look at that now. Now, there really are simply too many areas to look at to show that St. Cyril of Jerusalem did indeed utilize the Deuterocanonical books of Scripture. In his 16th lecture, lecture he calls the Deuterocanon, he utilizes the Deuterocanon and calls it part of the Old Testament. This is one thing that uh, a lot of people have looked over. It's a very important point that I've brought up in my dialogues. I have brought it up in debates of mine, a point that has not been looked at very often, and I have to point that out. In his ninth lecture, he says the Book of Wisdom is divine scripture. In his sixth lecture, he says to learn about the mightiness of God from Holy Writ, he quotes Job and then quotes Sirach. He calls Baruch prophetic the words of the prophet. By the way, yes, he does include the Book of Baruch there, a Deuterocanonical book. And I wonder, does Gavin Ortland believe that Baruch is either part of Jeremiah or does he believe it to be inspired, the word of God? In lecture 14, Cyril quotes as support of the doctrine of the ascension of Christ, that the prophet Habakkuk was carried by an angel in the Deuterocanonical portion of Daniel. He hearkens to one Maccabees scripture that shows divine truths, and on and on we can go and we can list voluminous um, amounts of information. St. Cyril of Jerusalem did not view the Deuterocanonical books the way modern-day Protestants did. So again, it's one thing to be referring certain books to catechumens. It's another thing to be calling certain books apocryphal. The Deuterocanon is never called apocryphal by St. Cyril of Jerusalem. Rather, he utilizes the Deuterocanonical books. And by the way, make a tally there of all of the books he uses. You will be shocked. He uses the Deuterocanon a ton of times. So if you have him utilizing Deuterocanon as part of the Bible, if you have him saying that the Book of Wisdom is divine scripture, if you have him saying that to learn about the mightiness of God, um, if, if you have him quoting Sirach to learn about the mightiness of God, of Baruch mean called prophetic, over and over and over, if he's hearkening to one Maccabees of scripture to show divine truths, are you then telling me that he's not using them as sacred scripture, if he's flat out telling us that they're divine and they are sacred scripture. This is where I just cannot get on board with Dr. Ortland's argumentation. I simply think sometimes Dr. Ortland is desperate to keep people Protestant rather than allowing them to open their eyes and view the beauty found within apostolic Christianity. I really cannot get on board because I believe sometimes really just it's not an example of honest apologetics at work. I don't think that at all. Uh, I saw issues with his work on the Assumption of Mary, issues with his work on purgatory. There's nothing wrong with not being an expert in every field. None of us are experts in every category and every field. And I get that there are people, maybe patrons, maybe subs, maybe people that support them. Uh, you know, maybe knocking down his door for answers because, you know, Protestantism is bleeding converts. You know, they're bleeding people from the, uh, they're bleeding members of their church and they're becoming Catholic converts. 
uh, you know, I, so I get that maybe he feels a little bit of pressure, uh, but really, really a lot of reading is required to really master these particular areas. I'm not saying I've mastered every area at all. Not at all. In fact, I refer to Gary as the master on the Deuteru canon. There's no one better than Gary when it comes to the Deuteru canon. Uh, but there are areas where I believe myself to be rather proficient in. And uh, and I've seen Dr. Ortland make uh, blunder after blunder where, uh, whether it be intentional or not, I think there's a massive amount of pressure on him to try to keep people Protestant. Uh, so he his nice person approach uh, is, is, uh, is one where Catholics have viewed as a great departure from the harsh tone found over at Alpha and Omega. People are loving Truth Unites. And people are saying, well, you know what? He's kind. He's charitable. Um, you know what? It's a great alternative to Alpha and Omega, where you've got the mean, big, bad wolf, James White there. Well, uh, I'm here to tell you that both of them are leading souls astray. Both of them are leading people out of the church. Both of them have a goal to poach people from Catholicism. Both of them have the goal to keep people lost in the darkness that is Protestantism, outside of the apostolic truth, outside of that apostolic fullness that can only be found within the Catholic Church. So I don't support either of those ministries at all. And I don't care if one of them has a nice guy approach and the other one has a big bad wolf approach. If both of them are attacking the one true church, the church that our incarnate Lord and Savior founded, Upon that rock, well, then uh, I'm sorry, but I don't find either of them to be uh, kind in their approaches. Um, now, is is there a certain level of respect that should be shown? Without a doubt, and, and I think I, I think Gavin has been good in this particular video. I haven't, again, I have not watched the whole video. Uh, the canon list is uh, very similar to a Protestant canon. You just have a few differences, like Baruch enfolded into the Book of Jeremiah, stuff like that. Outside of that, he does seem to use the word apocrypha for that which is outside of those books, those that specific list. Furthermore, the rationale for Cyril for forbidding the catechumens to read the apocrypha. I, I am really shocked. I, I have to rewind that and hear that again. I, I, I'm a little bit shocked. Let me hear that again. Side of those books, those that specific list. Furthermore, the rationale for Cyril for forbidding the catechumens to read the apocryphal books is not that they're just controversial or something like that. Rather, it's that the 22 books that he mentions are those that are, quote, read openly in the church or that we read openly in the church, like Baruch enfolded into the book of Jeremiah, stuff like that. Outside of that, he does seem to use the word apocrypha for that which is outside of those books. Unbelievable. Really unbelievable. Like I said, I, I, I am reacting in real time, so I, I'm rather shocked that uh, he will claim that outside of this list, everything else is, uh, is apocryphal. Uh, but that is ridiculous because he tells you right here, let all the rest be put aside in a secondary rank. And whatever books are not read in churches, these read not even by yourself. So there is a secondary rank. Those books that are read in churches, and then there are the apocryphal books. Here's my question. Where are any of the Deuterocanonical books ever listed as apocryphal by Cyril? That is my challenge to Dr. Ortland. Show us that the, and you can find apocryphal right here. Learn diligently from the church. What are the books of the Old Testament? What are those of the New? Pray, read none of the apocryphal writings. Cyril is very clear. He notes that there are some in Deutero. There are some that are also of secondary rank for him. There are some that are read in church. And he clearly calls the Deuterocanonical book, sacred scripture, divine writings. Where on earth does he allude to them being apocryphal? We're told that those books outside of this list, he considered apocryphal. But he tells you to read none of the apocryphal writings. Don't read the apocryphal writings. So an apocryphal writing would not be read in church. And we know that he called wisdom, Baruch, 
1 Maccabees, many other books, he utilized them as sacred scripture or flat out called them sacred scripture. Where on earth does he ever say that only these books are to be read? No, he talks about the books in the canon and those that are ecclesiastical, those that are read. Let's go back over it again. Look at this. Be very clearly important. Let all the rest be put in a secondary rank. Now, all the rest in a secondary rank, he would not be referring to a apocryphal books there. Because he clearly, the apocryphal books are those that are not read in churches. Look, and whatever books are not read in churches, so you clearly have the Deuteric Canon being read as ecclesiastical and sacred scripture, but those that are not read in churches, don't even read these by yourself. They're apocryphal. Shun every diabolical operation. Shun them. But he doesn't refer to the Deuteric Canon as apocrypha. I'm shocked that Dr. Ortland would even imply that or flat out even say that. Again, I'm simply not impressed by the arguments that Dr. Ortland puts forth. I cannot get on board with them because I find them to be downright wrong. And then in paragraph 35, he begins his list by saying, Of oh, these, read 22 books, and they have nothing to do with the apocryphal writings. Study earnestly only those books which we read openly in church. For far wiser and more devout than yourself were the apostles and the ancient bishops, the rulers of the church, who handed down these books. Therefore, since you are a child of the church, do not transgress her ordinances. Of the Old Testament, then, it has been said, study these 22 books, and if you are eager to learn, strive to fix them by name in your memory as I enumerate them. For the law of the books of Moses are the first five, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then he continues to list the proto-canon up to Jeremiah, where he says, Of Jeremiah, with Baruch, the Lamentations, and the Epistle, one, the Ezekiel, and the Book of Daniel, the 22nd of the Old Testament. Of the New Testament, there are only four Gospels, for the rest are not genuine and are harmful. The Manichaeans, who also wrote a Gospel according to Thomas, which through the spurious odor of sanctity conferred by its title, corrupts simple folk, received the Acts of the Apostles, in addition, the seven Catholic epistles of James, Peter, John, and Jude, then as a seal upon all of them, and the last work of the disciples, the 14 epistles of St. Paul. But let all the rest be put in the second, and whatever books are not read in the churches, read not by yourself in accordance with what you have been told thus far concerning these matters." Unquote. So as you can see here, Cyril of Jerusalem's list has a lot of affinity with Athanasius' list. First and most important, Cyril of Jerusalem does not use the same modern binary that we do today in terms of religious literature. For us, something is either inspired or it's not inspired, it's canonical or it's apocrypha. So there's only two possible categories. If it's one, then it's not the other, and if it's the other, it's not the one. However, like we saw with Athanasius, Cyril of Jerusalem here is dividing religious literature into three categories. Cyril does something similar here. The first category appears to be the 22 books, and these are the ones that the catechumen are to study and accept, then there are those that are read in the churches, which is kind of an interesting phrase. We saw something similar to that in uh, Origin of Alexandria's Letter to Africanus, where he talks about how the Deuterocanon is read in all the churches of Christ. So you have a wider category of the books that are read, but were not part of the 22. And then you have the third category of the Apocrypha, which Cyril says that the catechumens are not to read. So just like with Athanasius, the fact that he doesn't list the Deuterocanon amongst the 22 books for these catechumen 
doesn't mean that he rejects these books as not being inspired and not being canonical. Rather, they make up this middle category of the books that are read in the churches. And the catechumen are allowed to read it. Now, the very fact that Cyril of Jerusalem uses the Deuterocanon in these very same lectures shows that he did not include them among the Apocrypha. And since they're not listed amongst the 22 books that he explicitly lists, except for Baruch, um, therefore they fit within the books that are read in the churches that the catechumens are supposed to read. But as he says, he should, they should put them in second rank. The first rank should be the 22. Now, someone may say, ah, well, see, that shows the superiority of the 22 books. But why does he single out the 22 books? That's really the next question. Now, instead of somebody posing their own point of view on Cyril of Jerusalem, like saying that they're superior, that somehow they're truly scripture or something like that, we need to let Cyril of Jerusalem speak for himself and tell us exactly why does he single these books out for these brand new Christians to read? And we're very fortunate that we don't have to guess what Cyril meant and why he makes this distinction, because he already tells us at the very beginning of the catechetical lectures. In the portion of the lectures, the very first part, which is called the Procatechesis, in paragraph 10, he says, be faithful in your attendance of the catechizing even though we protract our discourse, do not let your mind yield to distraction. You are taking up arms against the enemy. You are taking up arms against heretics, against the Jews, against the Samaritans, against the Gentiles. Your enemies are many. Take plenty of ammunition. You have targets in plenty. You must learn how to shoot down the Greeks and do battle with the heretics. Jew and Samaritan. Your weapons are sharp, and the sharpest of all is the sword of the Spirit. But your right hand must strike with holy resolution to fight the fight of the Lord, if you would conquer the opposing powers and make yourself proof against every stratagem of heresy. The quote, the sword of the Spirit, comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 where Paul says that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So in these conflicts, where they are to shoot down the arguments of those who oppose them, which includes the Jews, obviously the Word of God that they use to oppose the Jews must be books that are accepted by Jews. And we have already seen this with, for example, Melito of Sardis, where Melito is requested to give a list of books so that he can give proof texts to be used to evangelize the Jews. And he lists the proto-canonical books minus Esther. We've also seen the same thing with Athanasius of Alexandria, where he places in the canonical list those books that can be used for evangelizing the Jews effectively because those are the books that Christians and Jews both mutually accept as divine scripture. So if the sword of the Spirit's the word of God and they are going to use them as weapons against the Jews, obviously the books that the catechumens will need to know and know very thoroughly are those books that the Jews accept as divine scripture. About Protestants removing books from the Bible. That's very simplistic. It's not true. This is why I made that video. It's because I... Yeah, I have to give Dr. Ortlund credit in that point. The idea that, well... Martin Luther removed the Deuterocanonical books. Nobody before him ever had any issue. Uh, Cardinal Cajetan didn't have any issue. The, everything was uh, rainbows and, uh, and unicorns. It's incorrect. It, it really is. Uh, and even the idea that Luther removed those Deuterocanonical books is a myth that we as Catholics, we need to stop repeating. I have told my fellow Catholic brothers and sisters, stop repeating that poor argument. Can you put the blame on Luther for getting the ball rolling that would later come to its culmination at the Synod of Dort? Without a doubt, you can. Without a doubt. Because before Luther, before we get to the Protestant revolt, you have these books being utilized in sacred scripture. And again, a point I have made from the very beginning, 
Every time the church gathered at council, local council even, every time it laid down the books of the Old and New Testaments, it included the Deuterocanon in the Old Testament. There's not a single time where you don't find that as an example in the early church. I believe that Gavin really doesn't talk a whole lot more on the canon, although I was sent a clip from an older video he had done where he does talk about the canon. And that particular image as well, I'm going to touch on those other fathers you talked about. Uh, this tiny clipper that I was sent from a previous video, I found to be uh, chock full of errors as well. Check it out. Errors that I believe, uh, I think he's uh, tried to fix a few of them. In the East, for example, well after the fourth century, you've got a Protestant canon that is the dominant view, or sorry, you've got a canon of scripture that's a dominant view that's very similar to a Protestant canon. Again, uh, let me emphasize again, you don't have the Protestant canon anywhere. The other point I have to emphasize, if you talk about canon the way we utilize it in the modern way, you are not utilizing canon the way the early fathers did. Remember, what is at discussion, what is our topic, is whether or not the early fathers used the Deuterocanon as holy writ, as divine scripture. And they did all throughout church history. This comes from the Synod of Laodicea. And you By the way, that is a spurious uh, uh, canon that he's referring to. That list is not even, is not even from that council. Uh, and indeed, I believe in the new video, in the new video that Gavin released, he, I think he put a little footnote there. I don't know if that was Gavin or Trent. I have no idea. Uh, but I imagine Gavin realizes now that the Synod of Laodicea, that he was actually referring to a spurious canon there. Uh, not surprised, Gavin has done that before, uh, utilizing the spurious canon from Elvira to uh, put forth his theological argumentation. Um, and again, I find it problematic that, you know, he's not doing his homework, doesn't do his homework on these particular issues. You see it all throughout the major Eastern theologians, Cyril of Jerusalem, Athanasius, Gregory of Nazianzus, all the way to John of Damascus in the seventh century. There's we got to look at Athanasius. We got to look at Gregory of Nazianzus. Uh, I don't know why I thought it was referring to Pope Gregory. It's Gregory of Nazianzus. Okay, we'll look at Gregory. We'll look at Athanasius. Anybody else? This idea of a twenty-two book Hebrew canon based upon the twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. All right. We're going to have to look at Athanasius, and then we'll look at uh, Gregory. So when we look at Athanasius, we don't have a Protestant canon. You have him uh, listing various books here, and he lists all the books that are of the Protestant canon, but you've got the, uh, the Book of Baruch there, and he does omit the Book of Esther. You don't have a Protestant canon there. But in the great St. Athanasius, you also have him noting, these are the fountains of salvation, so that who thirst may be filled by their discourses. In these alone, the Christian doctrine is taught. Let no one add to them or take anything from them, but for greater accuracy. So he needs to add for greater accuracy. I deem it necessary to add this also, that there are other books besides these, which indeed are not in the canon. So there are other books that are not in the canon. Okay, well, are they the word of God? Do they contain with them godliness, Athanasius? Yes, they do, but which the Father's decreed should be read to those who have lately come into the fold and seek to be catechized and who study to learn the Christian doctrine. These are the wisdom of Solomon, wisdom of Sirach, Plesiasticus, Esther, Judah, Tobias, the so-called doctrine of the apostles and pastor. Therefore, the former are in the canon. These latter are read. There's no mention of the Apocrypha. Indeed, like Cyril of Jerusalem, the Deuterocanonical books are not apocryphal, Dr. Ortland, which are the figment of heretics who arbitrarily write books to which they assign dates that by the specious semblance of antiquity, they may find occasion to deceive the simple. So you've got this incredible reality in him. The incredible reality and truth that St. Athanasius, by the way, 
I could list page after page after page after page of examples of St. Athanasius showing that the Deuteric Canon is used as Holy Writ by him all throughout his life. But again, here's the important thing. One thing that tends to get forgotten is that he says that, let's go to what he does say. Let's go to New Advent. Look at what the great Athanasius says right here. You have the full 39th festival letter online, by the way. But the former, my brethren, are included in the canon, the latter being read, nor is there any place a mention of the apocryphal writings. How do we know this is not apocryphal? Because these are instruction in the word of godliness. They include with them godliness. Athanasius is very clear. Anytime he tells you a certain book has godliness with him. He believes it to be the word of God, believes it to be scripture. Notice what he says, but for greater exactness, I add this also, greater exactness. And again, the point that I've got to hammer home, St. Athanasius utilized the Deuter Canon his whole life, even after the 39th Festival letter, all the way till before his death, he utilized the Deuter Canon and utilized it as sacred scripture. We were told that St. Gregory of Nazianzus as well uh, viewed the canon similar to the way Protestants do. Really? Well, we have God speaking through Sirach. God doth not so, but saith, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and that he cursed father or mother, let him die the death. Similarly, he gave honor to good and punishment to evil, and the blessing of a father strengthen the houses of children. But the curse of a mother uprooted the foundations. God says, similarly, is applied to two passages in Sirach, which is directly and put on par with the authority of Scripture, containing the Ten Commandments. Look at the second theological oration from Gregory, St. Gregory. And how shall we preserve the truth that God pervades all things and fills all? As it is written, do not I fill heaven and earth? Stayeth the Lord as it is written. And the spirit of the Lord filleth the world. Wisdom 1.7. If God partly contains and partly is contained, for either he will occupy an empty universe and so all things will have vanished for us with this result, that we shall have insulted God by making him a body. You'll find that, again, we should not look for a particular word of canon. Don't look for, oh, well, you know, did the Father use the word canon? What did he include in the canon? No. Look at how that early church father and all of the early fathers and early councils, look at how they utilize the Deuterocanonical text because they are not using the term canon the way a modern-day evangelical or the way a modern-day Catholic are using the term canon. How do we know that? We've covered it in a ton of our videos. And because if they were using it to be to be to equate it with what is part of the Bible or what is sacred scripture, if that was the way they were using the term canon, then they wouldn't be quoting books that they don't include in their canon. As holy writ. Plain and simple. How about we end the show with the words of Dr. Bart Ehrman, who agrees with us on this particular point. They merely quote them. I mean, they quote them, and before quoting them, they say, as Scripture says, or as holy writ says. And I've always been confounded as to why does Athanasius say canon and then he'll continue later in his life quoting books that he didn't include in the canon, but he yeah. considered to be holy writ. I've always been fascinated by that. Well, so let me tell you what a lot of scholars think, and yeah. um, which is that the term canon and yeah. the term scripture are not coterminous. Yes, I agree with you 100%. Meaning that, that yeah. something can be understood to be uh, some kind of authoritative scripture without being in the canon. Yeah, it I agree 100%. Weird, yeah. Especially if it seems weird to Protestants, but uh, but yeah. that, that does seem to be the case. I, I Earlier, I had made a comment that I was not sure of Gavin 
uh, had uh, backtracked on um, loud to say it does seem like uh, like he has. So uh, I have to give him, I have to applaud that, give him credit there. Uh, I think originally he, when he originally began talking about the canon, uh, that he uh, was perhaps not aware that he was quoting from a very heavily, highly contested uh, canonical list there. Very clearly that list of scripture uh, is definitely not from Laodicea. It was Laodicea is not, uh, it is not authentic uh, is what I mean. I'm glad that he, uh, he backtracked there. I believe it was him who added that note in the video, I think. Um, a lot of positives that can be taken from the video. The fact that uh, um, it really does seem to me that even though Gavin does get a lot of material wrong, uh, he, from what I gather, he realizes that there is no um, ancient testimony, ancient figure to point to him that will back up his canonical list, that will back up his Protestant canon and uh, a positive that I can take from it, perhaps not a positive that he wants to, perhaps something that he wouldn't view in a positive way, is that he very clearly uh, has, has resorted to saying, well, you know what, uh, none of these canonical lists line up with a Protestant list, but uh, they're a lot closer. And, and to that, of course, uh, Gavin is very incorrect there. He's incorrect because of the way we've shown you multiple times through video after video, how the early fathers at times are utilizing canon in a very different way than we are. Now, what is what matters? What matters above everything else is how they utilize the Deuterocanonical books. They call them Holy Writ. They call them Sacred Scripture. They call them Divine Writ. Over and over, the fathers that he claims held to a shorter Protestant canon clearly did not. You have the term canon being used in, various, in a very different way, St. Athanasius. We know that because after the 39th Festal letter, he begins, he continues to use the Deuterocanon as sacred scripture, does so throughout his whole life, even towards the very end, continues to quote them as holy writ. And trust me, I am still very shocked at the terrible blunders that Dr. Ortland made when it came to St. Cyril of Jerusalem. And I truly hope that he really does reconsider uh, diving in more into that, he will realize very, very unfortunate error he made there. And I really do hope that, that he, um, in all honesty, goes back and realizes and recognizes his error there. He will find that to claim that Cyril was referring to the Deuter, what we call the Deuterocanonical text, as being lumped in with the Apocrypha really, to me, is, is, is very, very unfortunate. But what else can be said? Now, um, I think I've been very fair. I think I'm always fair uh, with Gavin in every video uh, presentation that I do. Uh, and I think uh, I really went above and beyond to give him the benefit of the doubt in a lot of areas here that maybe maybe Gavin hasn't read up on the issue uh, a whole lot. Uh, maybe Gavin uh, needs to brush up on the issue. Uh, or maybe he really, um, maybe he is, plans to backtrack and certain comments he's made. I don't know. I don't know if any of that uh, really is the case. Uh, will Gavin interact with the video that we have done here? I don't know at all. I do know that we run the largest, and, and I know you're looking and saying, William, you, you guys barely got around 5,000 subs. Right. We are a niche channel here. Uh, we don't have 20, 30, or 40,000 uh, 40, subs here. Uh, we run a channel dedicated completely to the Deuterocanon, canon dedicated completely to the Deuterocanon, canon it is not a channel for everybody but we hope it'll be a channel for you and uh we would hope that gavin would realize that the only channel the only catholic channel uh devoted completely to the Deuterocanon canon has replied and we've replied more than one time by the way to the comments that he has made about the Deuterocanon. canon and we don't need Gavin to come back and reply or do a reply video. We're not bothered at all if he would do that or if he would ignore it. What we want is we want Gavin to realize his errors. We want Gavin to realize um, that we are putting out information that will educate the evangelical community, that will educate the Protestant community. 
And Gavin made a, made a brief comment, and I really did appreciate the comment. Gavin made the comment that, hey, uh, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, as if maybe other people were making videos hoping Gavin would go away. Um, and, and with Gavin letting people know that, hey, I'm not going anywhere. Well, Gavin, I'm not going anywhere either. If you have enjoyed the video, well, now we have reached the end. Have you enjoyed the video? Have you been edified? Do me a huge favor. Hit that like button. Smash that share button. Sub if you haven't subbed yet. And hey, do me a favor. Pray for me. Pray for my family. Pray for all of us and all of our families here at the Apocrypha Apocalypse. God keep you.